Welcome to episode 74 of Right Where You're Sitting Now, the podcast for the website sittingnow.co.uk. Uh, I'm anticipating uh, a little response when I introduce my co-host, Mr. Mark Satir. Well, I'm going to surprise you because I, <laughs> I, I, it's going to be a full-bodied, a full-bodied, uh, you know, copious response, which um, which is going to be, you know, uh, drawn out and um, elaborated on. As much as possible. Oh, there you go, there you go. And have you been in, during this heat wave, sir? I, li- I like the heat, actually. So, I, 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 but even, even, yes, it, was, it got a bit excessive. It got a bit Florida-esque. Let's put it that way. A bit in, excessive. In, in the UK, we've been, uh, we've been. The UK is not very good when it comes to weather. Basically, you, we, you know, we are masters of the drizzle and masters of the kind of um, clement day. But when it comes to snow or extreme heat we uh we, the, the country just crumbles especially snow i've found um, we, we just fall apart our transport systems disappear you know it's it's it happens every time <laughs> it's, it's kind of embarrassing actually you see all these other countries with their uh, wonderful um responses to these things but yeah we're, we're not so good at it so uh, especially with me anyway heat is a bit is a big one i'm not a big fan of it but anyway i digress that's um who are we talking about this week mr satir that which is dead and eternally lies after strange eons even death must die sitting now me and ken are descending into the the, the unfathomable depths to um to stir up in the lost city of royal um the, the sleep not dead but dreaming michael stately who um he will be regaling us on the Typhonian Order and its um, and its aspects. Well, more imp- um, what's the word I'm looking for? More keenly, more, we're actually more. talking about Kenneth Grant. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah. Uh, who he, who of course was the, the original head of um, the, the head, founder, the founder of the uh, yeah. Typhonian Order, and uh, yeah, 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 and the, and the character, the legacy. And the uh, the work of uh, Kenneth Grant, as expressed through the Typhonian Order, and as continued today through the Typhonian Order. Yeah, um, yeah. So we've finally done a Kenneth Grant episode to put it in a more um, a more straight. Uh, well, not straight. Or not more not as not as poetic. No, okay, there you go. Yeah. Not as floridly poetic. No, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm a by the numbers guy. It seems anyway. Uh, yeah. So we are talking to Michael Staley, uh, head of Starfire Publishing and um, member of the Typhonian Order, and we are talking mostly about Kenneth Grant, although we do touch on other. Um, other things within this interview and we hope you enjoy it so let's cut over to that now Hello Michael Staley Um, I'm wondering if you could give us a brief biography of yourself please Um, Yeah, yeah sure Um, I was born in the uh, August year of 1951 uh, in Bedford, moved up to London in 1987. Uh, I was interested in the occult for as long as I can remember. Um, and then uh, mid to late 60s, I took in how Crowley read most of his stuff about his work. Um, and then early 1970s, came across the work of Kenneth Grant, um, started a publication called Starfire uh, in 1986 that I uh, I carried on quite a while and then I became Kenneth Grant's um, publisher in um, the mid to late 19, uh, 1950s and currently I live in northwest London uh, with my wife, a cat uh, and a dog 
And um, at the moment, my main preoccupation is uh, is um, reprinting Kenneth Grant's books, uh, Typhonian trilogies, in paperback and hardback for the first time. Is this the first time they've been available in paperback? Because I've never, I've only ever seen yeah. them in hardback. No, no, no. Yeah. It is the first time. Um, some of the foreign translations of the Typhonian trilogies, they would be produced um, in in paperback, but certainly this current reprint is the first time, first time that they've been in paperback. It, it's actually been very successful. Um, I was actually quite taken aback. I mean, back in the 1980s, for instance, um, there wasn't really too much interest in, in Kenneth Grant. And even, even um, in the years after his death, when I was actually producing second editions of the books uh, with Steffi Grant, um, there still didn't seem to be much interest, and uh, for some for some reason, these reprints have really taken off. Yeah, I know. I go to Watkins a lot in London, and there's always absolutely tons of Grant stuff around. It's really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's excellent. <clears throat> so I think maybe it would be interesting to just get like a bit of background, like who is because there's going to be listeners who have heard us reference Kenneth Grant a lot in the show, but. Um, don't actually really know who he is. So maybe we could go into a kind of a biography of, of, of Kenneth Grant himself. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, Kenneth Grant was born in 1924 in Ilford. Um, he, again, I think that um, he was interested in the occult pretty much all of his life. And in 1939, um, Grant and a friend, <clears throat> Grant and a friend were um, in London, um, Charing Cross Road, and they came across uh, a bookstore outside. And one of the books on there uh, was *Magic and Theory and Practice* by Alistair Crowley. And because Kenneth was interested in the occult, uh, he. He was very, very attracted by this. So uh, he browsed it, bought it, read it, loved it. Um, and over the next few years, just basically got as much Crowley stuff as he could um, to read. And um, he tried to, he tried to uh, contact Crowley on several occasions, uh, at least, uh, at, at least two letters went uh, to, to Crowley, but they went to addresses in old copies of books, copies of old books and so forth. Uh, and then finally, in late 1944, responding to uh, a, fl uh, a flyer for the book of he did make contact with Crowley and went down to see him uh, in December 1944 at the Bell Inn, Aston Clinton, and they hit it off very well. Shortly after that, Crowley, Crowley moved to um, Hastings, to his final uh, lodging room at Hastings. And um, after, a couple, after a, a, a couple of visits, um, staying over the weekend, he, became, he went down, to, he went down to, uh, to actually live at the hotel. Well, uh, he was actually living in the grounds of the hotel. Uh, and functioning as Crowley's secretary in exchange for um, magical and mystical uh, tuition. Uh, he left a little bit earlier than anticipated. Uh, and uh, then soon after Crowley's death in 1947, um, in 1949, he and his wife met Austin Austin Spare, um, whose works Grant's been very familiar with since the early 1940s when he first came across a copy of the book Pleasure. So um, they again they got on very well in, in very well indeed. Grant rated Spare very, very highly, uh, loved his um, loved his artwork. And he and Steffi actually helped uh, Austin a lot with um, with well really day to day, -to -day uh, comestibles, but in addition, giving um, a lot of help with organising uh, the various exhibitions um, that Spare put on between 1949 and 1956. 
1955. Um, and then Grant had always been very, very keen on, on Indian mysticism um, in general and uh, Tantra, and he, he studied that. Kenneth actually, when he became interested in something, it was very intense, and he just plunged into it. So he would absorb an awful lot of information very quickly and become um, almost an expert very, very quickly um, as well. And then uh, in 1955, he founded New Isis Lodge. Um, from 59 to about 63, he and Steffi were publishing the Carfax monographs. Um, and then he, he made friends with John Simons, uh, Crowley's literary executor. And in the mid 1960s, uh, they decided between them um, that they would that they would republish uh, as much Crowley as much of Crowley as they could and also publish um, material that was previously unpublished and uh, probably the most notable books that they did was um, The Confessions of Alistair Crowley which came out in 1969 and The Magical Record of the Beast 666 which was um, early 1970s um, Kenneth had always been an inspiring writer. He'd, al he'd always been writing, whether it was poetry, short stories, um, books on, on magic, um, and, and so forth. And he'd started a study of Crowley in the late 1960s. And this actually became the magical revival of Alistair Crowley and the Hidden God. And, um, and then, basically, oh, over a span of about 30 years, uh, he produced the, um, the Typhonian trilogies. And then once the Typhonian trilogies were over, he, um, he produced very, uh, various other bits and pieces, like uh, he, he published a lot of the novels that, that he'd written in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Uh, and he put together things like At the Feet of Guru, which was a collection of um, a collection of essays on Indian mysticism that he had published in various Indian magazines uh, throughout the 50s and 60s. And then he and I, while since still alive, we produced second editions of uh, Outside the Service of Time and then um, The Magical Revival. And, uh, well, he finally died in early, early 2011. And basically since his death, his work has been kept in print and it, his work is becoming increasingly popular as the years go by, which is um, very heartening. Yeah, it's, it's really... Uh, so what was Kenneth Grant like a, as a person? What was his kind of character like? Well... When I met him, he was, which was uh, in the mid seventies. It was just kind of changing the way he'd been very, he'd been very, very gregarious in the forties, fifties, and sixties, and he was never a well man. So he stopped his kind of putting his horns in from the mid nineteen seventies. I liked him a lot. I found it well. I mean, obviously, he knew a lot. Um, knew a lot. Uh, we shared, you know similar interests um I actually, I actually found him a very kind witty man but i was always aware that he was an extremely private man and that he only kind of revealed to me what he wanted what he wanted um what he wanted me to see yeah i mean i liked him a lot but i as i say i was always aware that there were huge depths there um he was the most private he was the most private person that I've ever come across in my life, actually. And um, I found it a bit strange um, in the early in the early in the early nineteen eighties. Uh, I, I found it very odd, but you just accept people as they are, basically, don't you? But yeah, I liked him. I liked him a lot. 
Um, old, but he he was very very strong minded, very strong willed. Um, after I'd known him for a few years, I was able to just discuss matters with him and change his mind about various things um, on occasion. But uh, he was a very 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 strong willed. I think uh, I think uh, Ken, you you came close to interviewing Mr. Grant himself. Yeah, we we had a mutual contact and we came very close to um, to potentially having him. It was going to be quite a big deal. We we're going to this is because this podcast's been going for a very long time, um, and this is back in two thousand and eleven. It must have been. It was just before he died, just before he passed away. Um, we would we were in a discussion with him and we were going to actually interview him because he just didn't seem to be interviewed ever. Like you say, he was incredibly um, private. Um, but we had a mutual, quite close friend um, and he'd kind of brokered this thing between us. It was so it was so close to happening and then he he fell incredibly ill, didn't he, towards the end, I remember. Uh, yeah, well, he'd been sort of... <clears throat> his health was never the best, actually. Uh, he suffered from asthma uh, all, all his life. Um, and I, I mean, at one time, at one time, uh, he and I used to meet every month or so, but then as you got ill, it became less and less so. Yeah, I remember that was the concern that, because we, we even spoke about doing it as a written interview at one point, you know, like it would be written out um, because he was concerned about breathing problems and all kinds of things. So, it, Yeah, it would have been a written interview anyway, um, Ken, because he didn't have a computer. No, ever. yeah, yeah. I think we were going to try and do it on the phone with him uh, at one point. And then, um, yeah, anyway, it was really sad because it would have been great to have, um, you know, like to, because there's not many... There's not much kind of interviewee type material with him, is there? It's um... no, there's not. Do you know the only one that I'm aware of is, um, and I only know about it because I came across it in his diaries. But um, soon after the publication of the Magic Revival in 1972, uh, he was interviewed on BBC Radio London, and then um, and then highlights of that interview. Uh, were sort of in the radio <coughs> in the radio for pick of the week uh, a few days later. Oh wow! But, uh, yeah, and <coughs> Steffi Grant did try with the BBC to see years later if they got a copy. But back in those days, the BBC just weren't keeping tapes. So um, unfortunately, that's. That's gone. That's lost, um, lost the time. There was, some, there was some chap in America who, who was trying to track it down, but frankly, I don't think it's got a hope in hell because, you know, I mean, even some episodes of Doctor Who have gone. So <laughs> probably, oh, yeah. you know, an issue with Kenneth would be small beer compared to yeah. that you know, in BBC terms. Oh, tr- trust us, we know that uh, far too well, the Doctor Who <laughs> side of things. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah it's and of course, uh, I mean, an, I mean, an awful lot of stuff has gone. <coughs> I very frequently listen to uh, Radio 4 Extra and some of, for instance, Hancock Half Hours that they broadcast are only there because somebody somebody at home taped them. You mm. know? Yeah, yeah. Now, my partner recently, she bought the Hancock collection and it's it's crazy. Yeah, you're right. Some of them are like home recordings, aren't they? Rather than yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's sad, really. It's uh yeah, God knows what they were thinking about then. But uh, let's talk a little bit about Steffi as well, because I, I think she's often overlooked um, yeah, when it comes to is. when it comes to Kenneth Grant's work. And I think she's, you know, her her artwork in particular is incredibly important in the kind of history of the that kind of magical revival era, isn't it? You know, it's it kind is. of yeah, it is. it is. Well, basically, um, Steffi was a German German national. Uh, born in December 1923 in Berlin. Um, she, her, her family were Jewish. They were secular. They weren't Orthodox, but um, as far as the Nazis were concerned, they didn't actually differentiate. And so they basically had to flee uh, Germany. And so she came, the whole family came over more or less on the eve of the Second World War. Um, and she, uh, she, she came to London 
And then she met Kenneth Grant, I think, I think it was 1941, might have been 1940. Um, and they just kind of fell for each other. Um, and uh, Steffi, it, it, it's curious, you know, towards the end of her life, I asked Steffi one day, I said, um, Steffi, were you interested in the occult when you're interested in Germany? Expecting her to say yes. And to my amazement, she said no, she wasn't. So it was actually meeting Kenneth. But it was actually meeting Kenneth that sort of that sort of lit the blue touch paper for her, as it were. And it, it, it really is an extraordinary thing because her artwork, you know, it, it's so concentrated. You just wouldn't you just wouldn't imagine, would you, that um she was fairly new to it. No, and it's so um, you just see it in you know if, if you ever see books about the occult kind of thing, is it, without fail you see a Steffi Grant um, piece of art in there, don't you? And it's a, uh, it's mm. yeah, and it's such it's such you know we were talking about it the other day, weren't we? We we love the Carfax monographs in particular. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, yeah, she's she's definitely she definitely like I said feels like an overlooked figure <laughs> when it comes yeah. to. Uh, um, I mean. Well, basically, I mean, as far as the Carfax monographs uh, go, about half of the monographs are by her. As you say, her her influence is uh, very often overlooked. But uh, yeah, she right. I mean, I mean those those essays of hers in the Carfax monograph they're beautifully written. And and with the Carfax monograph, I understand there was like a sort of an interest. The Beatles had an interest, which is... well, basically, yeah. The story about that, the story about that is uh, one day on, on Lash Town about what uh, about fifteen years ago, I think it was. Um, somebody posted uh, to say that um, in the film Magical Mystery Tour, um, there were sections in there whereby the car fact whereby issues of the Carfax monograph were actually pinned up um, to the magician's lair. And this person who spotted it, he, he showed a few stills. Uh, and it was so, it was quite amazing, really, because, I mean, this was Magical Mystery Tour, 1967. I mean, I think, I think Kenneth Grant at that time was uh, quite, quite famous um, um, amongst uh, London occult circles. He was uh, a very obscure character um, outside those circles. So it's kind of kind of quite amazing that they're there, really, you know, in that film. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Uh, one thing I'm really interested in is... Um... Kenneth Grant's relationship with Craig. I, I, I bought recently. I had this amazing, strange, slightly magical experience. Actually, I went to um, uh, the Scoob Bookshop. They have like there's two two bookshops now. There's the original one, and then there's the they have this smaller one. I went oh, in yeah. there. I went in there because I knew Scoob used to put out his books, and um, they yeah. there's a particular one I was after called Remembering Alistair Crowley. Um, I went in there and asked about it and uh, they were like, oh, no, we haven't seen one of those in ages. And I thought, oh, that's a shame. I'll have to try and track it down online. And then went to the older shop and then this lady came running in and she said, I've just found, I've just been down to the basement and found the final wrapped copy of Remembering oh. Alistair Crowley. And I, I was like, oh, my God. And they, and they charged me the original price as well, which I was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. So, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so I've got a, a particular connection to that book. I love it. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, it is lovely. It yeah. Is lovely. Well, one thing, the, the kind of relationship between Crowley and Kenneth Grant, um, it feels like Crowley was almost slightly using Grant as like a a person to pick up his cigarettes and things doesn't it, at some points, you know. Uh, yeah, obviously, but... they had a deeper relationship than that, but you do get this impression that Crowley was, um, uh, you know, in need of uh, someone to do his bidding almost. It? It's, uh, yeah, it's... but I mean, by that, step, by that time, you know, he was old, he was ill. <clears throat> He was a drug addict. Um, he probably needed somebody to fetch and carry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's fascinating. It's um. So let's talk about because post Crowley, obviously, um, Kenneth Grant became involved with the OTO, didn't he? Well, I think he was already involved with the OTO, but he, uh, he had a, mo a more senior role in the OTO, didn't he? Um, post Crowley, and I, I'm really interested in this kind of new ISIS Lodge kind of era of of Kenneth Grant when 
when it was part of the ATO, and then uh, I'm interested in the kind of schism from the ATO. So okay. if you can talk about okay. that. Okay. Okay. Um, this, uh, I mean, I'll go into a bit of history as regards that then, because it, it's very interesting. Um, basically, whilst whilst he was whilst Kenneth was at Netherwood, or it might even have been been before on one of his previous visits to Crowley, um, he became a member of the OTO, but sort of it, it wasn't recorded in it, you know, he didn't get a certificate, it wasn't recorded in the documents. Um, however, in 1948, he he was in touch with Carl Germer, and Carl Germer Carl Germer basically, you know, gave him full documentation, certificate, etc. Now, the problem with the OTO comes about, I think, because Grant Grant was interested in what you might call the magical element in the OTO. <clears throat> um, and so, uh, well, I mean, there was never any question of him becoming Crowley's successor. Crowley wouldn't have done that because he was too young. He was too um, untested. Grant, Crowley, though, did have a very high, a very high regard um, for Grant. Uh, he had some reservations about about Grant as well, but he he had high regard for um, Grant's intensity and Grant's interest in in magic and mysticism. Now, so therefore, after the death of Crowley, he was working for a while. I mean, he he never met he never met Carl Gurman, uh, Crowley's uh, nominated successor. Um, but Gurman did actually give empower him to open a lodge, etc., etc., etc. Gurman never liked New Isis Lodge. Um, in 1955, uh, Ken sent him a copy of the manifesto, which he took he took grave exception to. Grave exception, indeed. Uh, I, I, I think the reason for it is uh, Gurman. Uh, was his his main concern was to uphold uh, Crowley's what he saw as Crowley's doctrine, and he saw he saw Kenneth Grant as um, as introducing innovations and uh, tampering with things uh, by his life, and they had uh, a very very frank exchange of views um, about manifesto of New Isis Lodge. Uh, Germa demanded that Kenneth withdraw the manifesto of the United States Lodge. Kenneth refused. Germa expelled him, and the rest is history. Um, Kenneth always had, I was going to say, he always had a poor, he had a poor opinion of Germa. In some ways, he didn't, because uh, ma the magical record of B666 is actually, is actually dedicated. Um, to Carl Germer. So, you know, he, he, he did see some positives about Germer, but, but he didn't think Germer was really interested in magic, certainly, certainly not in forging ahead. And so basically, after the expulsion by Germer, um, Kenneth just refused to accept it and just carried on as he was. Um, and so, hence, hence you get this thing, you get the OTO wars, say, in the 1970s, when you have um, the Calafet OTO in the States um, proceeding on the basis of uh, documents that Mercury had from Crowley. Um, and you have Grant, who, who, who considered himself to be the head of the OTO, and was always was always interested in the magic, not particularly bothered um, about about charters, uh, documents, and so forth. And uh, he just had a completely different vision um, from Germer. And uh, it's quite interesting. 
I've always thought it was very, very interesting that in the Oasis Lodge, Kenneth, Kenneth gives the, um, the date of it as 1955 to 1962. And I find that interesting because, of course, 62 was the year that Goma died. Mm, that's intriguing, isn't it? And uh, I mean, no, I've I've always thought that you know, if it produces, look, it's very the current. If the current sort of um, it's fertile and produces all these different sort of fascinating blooms, then that's a, that's always a, a yeah, it's a compliment to it. My understanding of New Isis, though, it's not so much the goddess. It's it's a meant to represent. It's a you uh, uh, forgive my ignorance, but it it's uh, sort of a planet or something outside the solar. Well, system. see, that's kind of. That's uh, very much a very much a moot point. New Isis, the the whole new the whole new Isis current didn't actually come out of out of nowhere. Kenneth seems to have picked up the idea um, from the, the the regular magazines of the German occultist uh, Eugen Groscher, and Gr Groscher went so far. Is to not only name this trans plutonic uh, planet Isis, but also came up with um, a symbol for it, um, came up with its um, uh, period of uh, orbit around the sun, all sorts of things. And Kenneth had very recently come out of his intense plunge into a fight of the dancer and uh, his kind of love of the wit rekindled etc came across this and it suddenly sparked off another epiphany and in the early months of 1955 he just uh he just just produced a whole new whole new series of uh, grade rituals um astonishingly astonishingly active and can you told me can you told me actually that although although the finish date it's given as 1962. In fact, um, he and a few colleagues carried on working until the mid-60s. I mean, I think there's a lot more to New Isis Lodge than the anecdotes that you get uh, scattered throughout Hector's Fountain. And I, I, I often think that what Kenneth Grant really means with that period of New Isis Lodge is the interior changes and the the realizations that he the, that he was going through because absolutely everything in Kenneth Grant really springs from that period, uh, 1955 to 1962, which seems to have been a real catalyst. Yeah, it's definitely. Um, I mean, I, I I'm sort of working my way through the books as you're releasing them <laughs> at the moment because uh -huh. uh, I've been somewhat guilty of. Uh, uh, of being somewhat of a crony elitist in the past, and now I'm, oh, and and that, and now I'm, uh, I'm sort of slightly better now. Yeah, We've yeah. All been there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I find his books genuinely quite exciting to read, and um, yeah, there's, a, I, I sort of skipped forward a bit um, to Hakate's Fountain because I'd heard stories of trapeze artists and <laughs> all sorts of uh, yeah, really, really yeah. interesting stuff, and it is, fa it's like, you know, it's, it's definitely um you know he's, he's it feels like he's definitely took a lot of the ritual side of things and the the actual true magical side of things to the extreme didn't he i mean compared to some other um you know occultists he's definitely and he, and he did record it in a really you know really interesting way as well and uh, yeah I, i'm you know that's a, a compliment to him actually I, I i do i do find him like really really exciting to read oh yeah yeah me too me too yeah yeah <laughs> Um, so, out of interest, so obviously we've got New Isis Lodge, and then this, um, and then for a long time there was the Typhonian OTO, and which is now the Typhonian Order. Um, yeah. So obviously but, there was a a bit of drama there, wasn't there as well? And well, I mean, to be awfully honest, the reason the reason for the change um, from Typhonian OTO to um, to uh, the Typhonian order is because, quite simply, um, it just wasn't possible anymore to dodge the bullet uh, from the from the people over in America from the Calipay OTO. You know, um, I basically stuff I'm publishing actually opposed uh, a trademark 
uh, to trademark uh, the name OTO um, over here in the in in the early two thousands. I mean, I felt, to be honest, that it was almost certainly it was too late to actually try and do something like that. But I also felt duty bound to have a bash um, as well. And uh, we actually lost that case. And, you know, it was made very, very clear to me by, shall we say, a certain person that unless we actually uh, took OTO out of our name, um, there would be a lot more, uh, shall we say, shall we say, financial penalties uh, to be faced. So... Um, that, so we t- we took the opportunity, but I mean, it is just a name, you know, Ken. Mm. Really, it is. It's the same order. I remember once, um, many years ago, uh, reading something by Kenneth, and I had a chat with him, and he, and you know, and said, "I think you're conflating Kenneth uh, New Isis Lodge with your earlier order, IBA." Look, he and Steph had found him um, in about 44. And he said to me, he said to me, well, Michael, as far as I'm concerned, they're all phases of, they're all phases of the same order. They're different phases that we go through. And he, and he was perfectly right. And so in the Typhonian order, for instance, um, it's basically basically the time for the OTO, which was basically another phase of New Isis Lodge, which was basically another phase of IBA. I've never heard of IBA. C- could you talk a bit about that, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I can, actually. Um, it was founded at uh, Kenneth and Steffi and a friend of theirs, and it was about 43, 44. I can't remember the precise name. And interestingly enough, um, there was they were still running it at the same time as um, as they were running uh, the British branch of the OTO on the basis of a charter from from Carl Germer. Um, we don't know too much about IBA to uh, to be honest. Um, one of the plates in Hector's Fountain is actually the frontispiece from from a manifesto. Um, of the uh, of the IBA, but that's kind of that's that's sort of all that, all of it that exists, unfortunately. So I can't really go too much too much more I- into that. I I was just very lucky. Um, soon after Kenneth died, um, Steffi Steffi gradually gave me access to more and more of Kenneth's papers, and um, and sort of let let me and someone else just really get on with. Um, indexing them and cataloging correspondence. So, so I learned an awful lot, you know. Um, I learned an awful lot about things, about, well, when I say an awful lot, as you might have gathered from what I've said, there's not not too much is known about uh, about IBA. And um, uh, <clears throat> Steffi couldn't remember too much about it, to be honest, either. One of the other things that's always fascinated me about Gra- Kenneth Grant is the um, his relationship with John Simons. Is um, it f- and actually John Simons himself and his relationship with Crowley is also pretty fascinating. He he certainly didn't seem too keen on Crowley, and I've always wondered why he ended up as the kind of executor of his uh, of his. Um, his work is it? It's- yeah, it is extraordinary, really. Um, there were two literary executors, um, Oliver Wilkinson and John Simons. Um, basically, John Simons came along in Crowley's life kind of quite late, and Simons was uh, the editor of um, a London magazine called The Lilliputia or, 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 or something like that, and um, he. He got at least one article by Crowley into one of his issues of the of uh, Lilliput or Lilliput, whatever it's called. Um, he told he told uh, Crowley that he'd like to do a biography of him after his death, and so I, I, I think 
I think that's the main reason, to be honest, why he was made literary executive, because he, uh, as you said, he seemed to have a very poor opinion of Crowley. Um, and I, in some ways, I think that Kenneth and he made a bit of an odd couple because um, I don't think that I don't I don't think that John Simons ever lost his uh, contempt, really, I think, for, for Crowley. And, and of course, Kenneth Grant was devoted to Crowley. Um, but John didn't really know very much. All of the information essentially came from Kenneth, you know, in all of the books that they did. I mean, I think there's a famous thing. Uh, they both do, they both do um, a, a forward or introduction, I think, to, um, to um, the confessions. And, you know, John Simons sort of writes quite a bit. And uh, Kenneth is fairly short and sweet to the point. You know, it says, I think it, it's, fairly, it's fairly plain. Uh, from uh, John, from 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 John's introduction, that he doesn't accept the law of Philema, and I do, and that was about it, really. You know, but essentially, though, uh, with um, with the confessions, um, almost all of it, you know, notes and research and so forth, would have been done by Kenneth. Uh, that, that sort of brings up another point of of interest with, with the Typhonian order, which was. Um, how much of it because obviously Kenneth's work diverged quite significantly from Crowley's um uh more traditional yeah. philema, I suppose you could say. Um so how does does the Typhonia Typhonian order kind of still consider itself a philemic group or yes. uh, um yes, and, and, what's, and what's its relationship to the Book of the Law, would you say? Well, basically, um uh, we we still we still accept the Book of the Law. You know, nothing's changed there. You know, it it's still. I mean, I think that we don't have the same kind of canonical devotion to the law um, that some Thelemites do. We don't, for instance, perform the Gnostic Mass, which you know, for a lot for a lot of Thelemites, particularly over in the states, that would immediately just bar you from from well. <clears throat> Certainly, certainly from considering yourself uh, the OTO, but I mean, I mean, there are some there are some parts of the book of the law that I've just always found very, very difficult indeed. Uh, I, I mean, for instance, you know, I'm a socialist by nature, and I find some of some of the some of the kind of fairly brutal, shall we say, aristocratic stuff to be a bit hard to take. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean. We could elaborate on this. <laughs> 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 yes. Uh, well, I've always thought that the, um, the 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 angel that Jacob wrestled with until dawn was a was that was his that was his real name and and being a Thelemite is somebody who's actively struggling with the book of the law, but uh, that's just purely my own personal thing on it. I when I think of uh, Grant, I always relate him to H. B. Lovecraft, and and I'm fascinated to hear what the how that how that influences how that influenced grant and how it influenced the typhonian order today okay well basically you can't look at lovecraft in isolation I don't think. But kenneth had a huge attraction to um to um uh, occult and weird um novels uh, I, I mean for instance Possibly his very, very favourite writer was Arthur, was Arthur Macken. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Macken's work. Uh, it just so happens when, uh, when it comes to Lovecraft uh, that, you know, Lovecraft's name is, is probably larger and uh, more remembered. I, I think, though, in my opinion, um, some people get hold of the wrong end of the stick when it comes to Lovecraft um, and Grant. Grant's main thesis, really, on Lovecraft, I think, is set out in a chapter in The Magic Revival, Barbara's Names uh, and the Occasion, where he draws up, um, there's, this, there's this interesting comparative table um, of kind of 
central elements in what you might call the love craft, the love craft you notice, the cookaloo notice, no, notice. And, and, uh, and Crowell is, for want of a better word, cult. It's, it's kind of very interesting. Uh, the key to it, I think, um, the key to it basically is that the thinking behind it is that there's just one consciousness. We're not loads and loads of isolated consciousness. And, and, and very often, the writer, he might think that he's just, he or she is just inventing something, but actually they're drawing upon inspiration from, from the depths of consciousness, from, from the depths of imagination. So therefore, um, that kind of table of correspondences or affinities between Lovecraft and Crowley isn't as far-fetched as one might think if you accept that, that, that these writers are drawing to a greater or lesser extent to, um, to an unconscious uh, extent, probably, um, on, I don't know, um, possibly the Jungian collective unconscious. I was going to say, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a classical sort of uh, Jungian perspective on it. But, yeah. but, but, and, and uh, I suppose with uh, the relationship with Mackham and Lovecraft, I mean, what's happened? I mean, Mackham was far more uh, successful in his, his, in his life, actually, well known. And Lovecraft yeah. has been revived amazingly. I, I never thought in my life, in my life, I'd see uh, Lovecraft's works published under the Penguins classic. Um, oh, really? Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, that, that's not true. I mean, I'm, 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 I, I love Lovecraft, and um, I insist yeah. that I insist on in reading. I've collected all those lurid seventies uh, paper. Oh, they're, they're great, aren't they? Uh, with the, I, I, I don't, I won't read it under any other cover. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very fussy about that. I mean, he, he, he's a great. Uh, I, I've read every every one, and he's a great um, mm -hmm. he's a great writer. But why love what's your what? favorite? Uh, yeah, what? Yeah, what's my favorite? What's the one that lives with me the most? Mm. Ah, ah, I know what it is. It's um, outside the. It's the the shadow. No, out the the shadow from out of time. It's called time. What's that one with the yeah, great yeah. race of Yith? Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, and I won't give the ending away, but there's. The, the uh, there's a I like the the reveal at the end. Actually, mm -hmm. that one mentions uh, Crowley. There's a character, uh, Lovecraft actually mentions a, a, a sin, a, you know, a, a mysterious, yes. sinister character. It's not for that reason at all. It's just I just happened to like that particular story. Um, but what is it in the in Lovecraft in Lovecraft's narrative that spoke to Grant more vividly? Than... I think probably it was the sheer imagination of the stories. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean sort of <clears throat> to be honest, I'm, I'm not that interested in the, in what you, you might call the pan pantheon and things like that. What I am interested in is the rich imagination um, of Lovecraft. So <clears throat> many, many years ago, uh, I, I, I wrote a book I, and it was really interesting because um, you, you've, you've probably heard you probably heard that a lot of the a lot that Lovecraft drew uh, upon vivid dreams for his books, and this and this one this book it would actually it would actually have uh, an account by Lovecraft of his dream, and then it would be juxtaposed with the short story. That it inspired, and uh, really, really interesting, really interesting to read that. Yeah, which character was it that there's a particular character? Is it Nala Fotep? One of them, where he he dreamt that he a friend of his came running up to him and said, "Beware!" It, it was a really creepy, actually. His own description of 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 this um, experience in this dream is actually is is told in a you know obviously in a Lovecraft way, but it's <laughs> there's, he has this particularly vivid dream of a friend warning him about this character, this shadowy character, and he couldn't stop dreaming about him and. Uh, yeah, I, I I found that really. Well, which one was it? You you'll know which one. Was it Nala Fotep or? Um, it sounds like it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, the sort of shadowy dark character. Yeah, was it this one. But yeah, but anyway, sorry, that was just a side note. But <laughs> wasn't Nala Fotep the the goat of a thousand young? 
Oh, Something maybe. Like. It was definitely... No, no, that's... that's uh, no, that, no. No. <laughs> no, no, uh, no. The, uh, <laughs> no, this is the one with the long red tentacle instead of a head. That's that's, and he was like the messenger of the gods. He's like a sort of mercurial kind of messenger of the gods type, mm. psychopompic, yeah, thing. Uh, thing being the operative word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and also as well. I mean, in the in the sort of in the Cthulhu mythos. I mean, at the centre of that, of course, is Cthulhu, and um, and you know, you have got there the idea of something dreaming beneath. It's very much like Atlantis, isn't it? It calls on. The, I'm surprised. You know, so it reminds me of the Theosophists with the ideas of Atlantis. You got this sort of lost city, you know, and the, and this monster dreaming beneath the beneath the waves it's great to it's it's great that lots that cthulhu is far more well known to people now he's, he's sort of entered um people's understanding of things and and uh i know that um i mean august derlith he he, he ran with lots of lovecraft things but he had a he had a particular he had a very different take i mean lovecraft was a kind he did, of yeah yeah so sort of lovecraft was a kind of nihilist in a essentially and but derlith was a catholic and the idea of Good and evil, in the sort of classical sense of the word, is 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 more apparent. And um, yeah. I don't think it's, it's, it's not as imaginative. And I think he no. he, he conceives of Cthulhu as, as not as imaginatively, and as a kind of sort of watery elemental thing. I mean, there's an element of that. I mean, an element of that. <laughs> there's an element of that. <laughs> but there's a, there's a bit more to the idea. I I, I love Cthulhu. I I feel. Let's talk about some other influences on Kenneth Grant because uh, one of them in particular we've mentioned him already, um, but you know he's a, a very, a, another kind of prominent character within the occult who again seems to have had a bit of a renaissance recently, which is uh, Austin Osman Spare. Um, so let's talk a bit about the relationship between Grant and Spare because I, I believe it was Steffi that actually introduced them, or that they met via Steffi rather than directly, you know, via well, Kenneth. Yeah. Well, basically, what happened was um, in the early 1940s, maybe 41, something like that, um, Michael Houghton, who then ran, who founded the um, the Atlantis Bookshop, uh, he showed Kenneth a copy of the Book of Pleasure. And Kenneth was enraptured by that. Um, and much the same as he'd done with Crowley, he says about reading as much spare uh, uh, by getting hold of as much spare as he could. But for some reason, he assumed that spare was long dead. Um, I, 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 he never really knew why uh, he actually thought that. So, um, so they were both interested, um, Kennedy and Steffi, in spare. And but you know. Like I say, they assumed Spare was dead. And then what happened basically was um, a friend of theirs, a friend of theirs came across uh, a copy of a magazine article about Spare and a few photographs of him um, in his sort of hovel of the room with some cats and so forth, and uh, showed it to Kenneth and Stephanie. And so basically, uh, Steffi wrote, Steffi wrote uh, to spare care of the magazine, um, <clears throat> asked if she could come and see him, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which was fine, and she did. <clears throat> and then uh, the next time they met, she took Kenneth along. And, uh, well, basically, Kenneth and Spare got on very, very well indeed. But so that, that is... That is the basis about how they met. Yes, you know, it, it, it's perfectly right. It, it was Steffi that actually, uh, once they realised he was alive, that actually uh, went out and uh, and sought him out as well. Mm. And so what kind of influence, though, would you say? There was obviously a relationship built there, and uh, Kenneth wrote a lot about um spare in his books uh, i was just wondering like how would you describe the the kind of influ- the kind of relationship between the two of them and the kind of influence spare had on grant's work um well basically um i believe i mean it's pretty evident to me talking to talking to kenneth about spare and then after his death um 
talking to Stephanie about spare, that they both loved spare very much. Um, I personally think that spare was the bigger influence on, on Grant's outlook, development, and his work than Crowley was, actually. Um, it's kind of curious because, you know, Crowley is mentioned a lot more throughout his books and spare is, but um, I, I just think, actually, that, that he made much the greater influence. Plus, you know, he knew spare. He knew spare for a lot longer. You know, um, effectively, he spent about a year, less than a year, being told, um, you know, sort of meeting Crowley for a few times and then going down to live as his secretary. Um, and also the relationship was a completely different one because there was a formality about Crowley. Um, you know, you could you could slap uh, you could slap spare on his back, you know, in front of me, and it would be fine. You wouldn't dream of doing that with Crowley. So it's a very 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 different relationship. But uh, he found a great affinity, I think, between his interest in the advice of the um, and spare. He wrote, and he wrote. Um, a very, very fine um, essay, well, it, it's a book really, um, about Spare. That he completed it in Spare's lifetime, he showed it to Spare, uh, and Spare liked it. And um, unfortunately, the version of it that, that Spare would have seen hasn't survived. What has survived is two later typescripts, but it shows a man who, who has really plunged to the heart um, Spare's work, and of course, and of course, he had the opportunity of discussing it with, um, with Spare as well, because um, Spare's work is is um, it can be very very obscure, but you know, once you actually find your way into it, 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 it it's pretty really dynamite stuff. I had to buy a book. Uh, I think it was it, the Book of Pleasure I bought originally, and I, I it I have to be honest, it was a it was it was too uh, uh it was too uh i just couldn't, yeah, I couldn't find very, a way in um but it's very, it's very very difficult do you know what i i was like that for years with the profession and then and then some publisher approached me and you know to write an essay on it and said you know just take just take just take a couple of things and write about that and so i i found that that actually gave me a way in you know, I, I, I cracked it, but the problem, the problem, problem with, with, with the book of pleasure, though, is that, is that his fluency and his articulacy with, um, with drawing, painting, etc., just wasn't matched um, by, 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 you know, writing, you know, I'm sorry to say, and, and, and part of the problem with the book of pleasure is sheer way that it's written, you know, you know, sort of uh, strange punctuation, strange syntax, a love of obscure words. It's very, very cumbersome. I personally prefer his later works, the works that were published in Zoss Speaks. Um, I find he's a lot clearer by then. There is a volume, isn't there, that came out maybe fairly recently? I, I picked it up myself. It's like a sort of... Um... Book of Pleasure for Dummies, almost. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of Book of Pleasure for Plain English. Yeah, plain yeah, English. yeah. But I, I don't like, I don't like the approach at all. You know, I sort of come from school, school four, that you just kind of persevere with something. And uh, I do know, I do know the guy that wrote it, and I have had, I have, have had conversations uh, with, with him about it. Yeah. Well, hopefully, yeah, yeah. I mean, it will. I mean, it will. I mean, it will show people that you can, you can, you if you work hard at it, you can, you can. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, there's an there's an argument after all for saying that you know if you've read the Empty book Pleasure Empty Times and can't get anywhere, then <clears throat> is there really any harm in reading a uh, book of pleasure in plain English and then going back to the book of pleasure, mm. you know, armed with, um, you know, because it, you know, it might have been a eureka moment for you. Know. 
Yeah. I mean, what I, yeah, I would be, I would be very cautious if, if somebody read the, with the lubricated book of pleasure and and then they and then they thought oh well i've read that now i don't need to go to that you need to go to the fountain head with all these things and, yeah, yeah no i i feel that way too and um another big influence well another person that grant was interesting in presenting to the world was uh Frat arcad wasn't it and uh and yes. um, yeah and the two of my favorite starfire books i must say at this point at this juncture is the the collection of um as well as the Carfax monographs, personally, uh, is also the the very recent publication, very handsome, very handsome, and very exquisitely edited. I must say, for somebody like me, uh, of, the, <laughs> of the of the letters of the letters uh, regarding about and you know that that correspondence with Gerald York and and uh, yeah yeah well <clears throat> basically basically uh, Kenneth wasn't that familiar initially with um with archive with with archive's work what happened was though at the time at the time that archive was writing to gerald york basically basically york wrote to archive in early 1948 to say that he, that he was ordering her his papers and he wasn't a copy of a certain book a certain document of our cards in there and including supply and copy. <clears throat> and so basically at this time, 1948, 1949, uh, Kenneth and Gerald York uh, used to cooperate in uh, in 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 producing uh, typed copies of what they thought were the really important items of the Crow's work before the whole thing was shipped off to Gurma. Um, under the terms of Crowley's will, and so, um, and so, you know, <clears throat> he would have discussions with York about <clears throat> some of these letters that, that were coming through from archive, and then um, about uh, a few months after Archive died, um, York York asked Kenneth to um, to make a typed copy of the whole lot for him. And that's when Kenneth really started to get interested um, in archive. So obviously he, he then went back and went through the, the back catalogue, the back catalogue of archive's work, etc., and began to take a keen interest in it. I suppose I mean, I'd like to have you back on at some point and do an entire show on archive, but... Um... No, that's could, great. Could we um, maybe just get a little overview? I mean, you just recently published the incoming of the Aeon of Matt, I think it's called, or Mark, the book that yeah. Mark referenced. But uh, there are going to be people out there who don't know who Frater Arcad is. And could you give us like a kind of potted, <coughs> a potted uh, description of the man and 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 his um, his his work? I suppose. Arcad yes. in, <coughs> in a nutshell. Uh, yeah, Arcad in a nutshell. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, basically, um, Arcad was. Well, basically. One of the early members of the AA, the Astrum uh, Argentium, and became um, a bit of a bit of a favourite pupil of Crowley's, and then um, and then about around 1915, uh, I think it was 1915, um, Arcade, Arcade sort of. I took advantage of this um, of this um, idea that anybody could declare themselves a master of the temple. Um, you know, I think it's called them. it's called the oath of the abyss. I believe. Yeah, the oath of the abyss. So he took the oath of the abyss, and um, <clears throat> and and through a, a, a weird set of circumstances. Uh, Crowley recognised him as his magical son and his heir, and um, things were okay, okay for a while. But then, you know, uh, Uckert says in one of his letters to York that the Crowley's idea was that you would always do his will um, and always help him. And um, Uckert began to have his own way. Really have his own ideas and so tension set in uh, between them and then uh, Akkad started writing 
stuff, writing and publishing stuff, you know, uh, things like QBL and The Magical Arrival, which books that Crowley absolutely hated. And um, so the gap between them became quite wide. And then, and then sort of he accused Uckard quite unjustly of uh, stealing uh, a stock of books that uh, the Crowley had left in care for him. And um, they sort of, uh, they, they sort of had a, what you might call a legal separation of their, of their financial affairs in 1926. And thereafter, um, they would have just kind of in, in, intimate, intimate um, contact. For instance, in 1936, Crowley actually wrote, Crowley actually wrote to Arcade and initiated this, um, this correspondence, which was, you know, quite good at first, but you know, soon uh, the old uh, the old grudges and the old accusations uh, resumed. You know about Uckard stealing his books to bring them out after 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 Crowley died. And um, I think the the other thing was that uh, Uckard took a great deal of interest in the early nineteen twenties in an organisation called. Um, uh, Universal Brotherhood. Yeah, Universal Brotherhood. Uh, again, which Crowley, which Crowley abhorred. Um, I think it's largely <clears throat> Crowley. Crowley had this hang up about other occult organisations. Um, you know, he thought they should all subsume into his organisation. So he saw Akkad become increasingly involved in this Universal Brotherhood, and. Um, you know, all all these things really came to this came to, as I say, this head in 1926. So I could just carried on with his work. He, he he still had he still had a deep attachment to to Crowley's work and to Philema, and uh, he he just 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 produced um, produced his own books. You know, and as I say, there was intimate contact with Crowley, and <clears throat> it would invariably end uh, badly. And uh, and then, and that's where the incoming of that book, the incoming of the end of what, um, comes in when when he made contact with York in early 1948. And one of the things, I mean, one of the things that I think is fantastic. Uh, about those letters, quite apart, quite apart from this incoming of the Ian Mark business, um, is the fantastic detail that he has. You know, the 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 historical data that he's coming out with about you know his time with Crowley, and especially the time in America, uh, just fantastic, really. But fundamentally, in nineteen. Um, 1948, it was. Um, he detected he detected intimations of another eel um, coming in. Uh, he was a very very sensitive man, and he it it would really be intuition, and um, this became the Ian of Mark. So there's a strange relationship between the Ian of Mark and the Mark eel. Um, but you know, to all intents and purposes, they that they can be seen as the same. Um, I think you know a lot of Thelemites found it uh, very very hard to swallow the the Inn of Horus, which was uh, <clears throat> thought you know expected to last two thousand years or so, you know, tied to the procession of the equinoxes, etc., um, had been superseded. You know, um, you know, a mere forty-four years later. But um, Crowley hadn't always Crowley, Crowley hadn't always had this idea uh, that the eons were tied to the procession of the equinoxes and therefore covered specific spans of time. And um, I could have never, never. Uh, he was always a mystic, and I don't think he ever accepted this idea of. Uh, the eons having spans of time. I think he saw them really as uh, levels of initiation, as, as indeed I think Crowley did initially. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I must, I, 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 I must have encountered um, Arkad and his work, um, and his, and his, in his particular role in the sort of uh, uh, Crowley story uh, through Kenneth Grant originally, actually. And then, uh, but what I'm not so clear about: what about Jack Parsons? How, what was Kenneth Grant's take on Jack Parsons? He's a character that has appeared again. He's another character that is part of the story. He was become more prominent or well there's there's more of him <laughs> there's more of him around at the, it seems at the moment i mean obviously these days communication is a lot lot simpler via the internet email etc 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 but sort of um after crowley died uh what was going on in america in california with the old agape lodge was something that people didn't really know very much about. Uh, I mean, for instance, in 1955, um, the Grants were friends for a while with uh, Kenneth Anger. And Kenneth Anger had known Marjorie, Marjorie Cameron. Um, in fact, uh, he lived on and off with uh, Marjorie Cameron, I believe. And, um, and so, and obviously, Obviously, Gerald York had got all the press cuttings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, when Parsons, you know, the Parsons had blown himself up and, uh, <clears throat> and so forth. And um, I don't think, to be honest, I don't think that he had too much time for Jack Parsons. I mean, sort of like Jack Parsons, Jack Parsons, uh, because he died young, you know, there is a specific glamour that attaches to people that die young, um, essentially. And he w he was articular, you know, and, and some of his essays uh, are very fine. I don't think really, though, that uh, Kenneth ever sort of got got influenced by by Jack Parsons, um, as it were, simply because I don't, don't really think uh, there was a lot to be influenced by. Yeah, I don't. Are you, yeah, he's premature death. Um, he, there's an there's an alternative universe where he doesn't die, and then <laughs> then then the, he sort of who knows what happens in that one. But one of the th one of the things I've always been curious about is that uh, one of I don't know if you're familiar with it, Mister Staley, but uh, there's a a, a, a a sort of a novel by uh, Jack Wilmanson who's the yeah, same science fiction writer, but it's a gothic novel. It's called uh, Darker Than You Think, uh, and it's written there. Well, it was published originally in 1948, and there, there's an image in that of a, a naked woman with long red hair who rides on the back of this saber-toothed tiger, and Jack Parsons strongly identified that with Babylon and the Beast, and it always struck me as... Uh, curious or, or um, conspic conspicuous or almost absence that Kenneth Grant never refers to the book because he, he, you would think that he'd be um, on that, you know, like a, I, I don't know what, but uh, you would think that would be something he'd be sort of um, he'd lap up Yeah, but sorry, I perhaps he just never came across it you know, perhaps it just wasn't, perhaps it, it just wasn't an author that interested him very much yeah, well, I mean, I'm, yeah, I mean, that's, that's that's sort of curious to me, but I don't know what to, I don't know what, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know. It's a mystery. We will never know, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing I'm interested in uh, with the Typhonian order is, um, obviously, I, I know very little about the order, uh, and I'm kind of interested in its kind of um, its similarities, I suppose, to the existing OTO, like in terms of like. How 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 is it structured? Is it an initiatory order? Is it a fraternal order? You know, I, I don't... Uh, yeah. I mean, sort of. Well, I mean, you know, uh, it still has um, things like you know, first degree, second degree, third degree, etc., etc., etc. We accept the law of Lima. Um, obviously, required people that sort of apply to be members uh, must. Uh, Except the law of Lima, um, I've got, I've got, I've over the years, I've had pretty good relations with Bill Brees, um, but there's no initiation. In, this was true in the Typhonian OTO, and it's true in the Typhonian Order. There's initiation isn't something conferred. 
initiation is something um, that that just comes about as a result of magical mystical experience. That's quite similar to the but, Temple of Set, actually, isn't it? We, we were talking to um, Don Webb in, in, oh, yeah. in an episode recently, and it, interestingly in that um they said that the temple of set don't have like kind of set initiations that are performed they're kind of like it, it's almost like a you get to a certain point and that's your initiation almost you know within your magical experience and he also said that um during there was a period of time especially with things like the left hand path uh becoming a, more of a, a thing i suppose um where it almost they almost seem to happen in 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 sync like kenneth grant seemed to be um becoming more interested in it uh and publishing more about it at the same sort of time as the temple of set were also interested in it there seemed to be this kind of current appearing um and that was another thing i was actually going to ask you about was was grant's relationship with the left hand path he seemed to really explore things like the cliff off and you know the kind of um he, he seemed to have a real interest in the left hand path didn't he there's almost a, a a sort of maybe maybe just a thematic link but there seems to be this link with Grant, um, the Temple of Set, and Anton Levey all kind of um, becoming interested in in the left hand path and this kind of concept. Yeah, of the left -hand I path. think though, you know, to be honest, Ken, I, I think the part part of the problem here is the left hand path just seems to cover such a diversity, such a wide area. I think that when Kenneth was using it. Um, and I, I suppose probably a, a bit of a classic here would be Cults of the Shadow. Um, he says in there, he says in there that sort of the the he takes it be, because it it's something about being physically on the left hand side um, of of the Shakti of the Scarlet Woman, something like that, and sort of. In, I sometimes think that in Anton Bay and things like that, it left hand path becomes this kind of more satanic thing. Um, so, you know, it's, as I say, it, it, it's one of those things that covers a wide area. It, you know, it's not just the left hand path, of course, is it? I mean, even the term black brother. Um, yeah, I think also as well, the like you say, Mr. Staley, uh, yeah, yeah, I think originally left hand path is a is a tantric term and 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 it's but it's in literature. I'm I'm now trying to think of the the writer. Oh God, there we go again. Uh, I'm trying to think of the writer. He was part of the Lovecraft circle actually. Who uses the first time it's ever used in fiction, the left hand path. I can't remember who that is now, but uh... we're being thrown off again here. <laughs> so um, I think, um, obviously, I don't want to we keep you up all night, but uh, it would be interested. Like, what is the uh, vision for the kind of the future development of the Typhonian Order, and um, where uh, it is? You know, how do you see it kind of uh, progressing into well, the future? Okay, okay. Well, I mean, like at the moment, um, I think it's fair to say that its, its centre of gravity, its focus is, is on grants. You know, I think I think it's fairly natural, but it's going to be a case of 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 sort of plunging into grants work, getting to the kernel of it, and then actually moving beyond it, you know, because uh I mean <clears throat> You can never know. It, it's kind of a, a, a bit trite to say so, but I don't think that Kenneth Grant would have, would have expected um, that his work would just assume almost a, can, a canonical status. I think that he would have expected that people would have would have gone beyond it, and that will happen. That will happen. There's no doubt at all about that. There's certainly a. Um tendency with thelemites to not want to push past crowley or sort of develop on crowley this is something i think about quite a lot and it it, fe it feels that like that's may have stunted the growth of thelema overall actually that people are so obsessively um just sort of focusing on crowley and his writing rather than sort of developing it and allowing it to grow yeah it, yeah. But, yeah but you see you know i'm sure i'm sure that there are thelemic groups and there are uh Thelemic, uh, thelemic individuals that are 
that, that do approach Cronin uh, from the point of view of inspiration, i.e., you know, i.e., buying his work and seeking to go beyond Cronin. Um, and ultimately, that will out, you know, like say, I think it's fair to say that we've got a lot of Cronianity around at the moment, but I don't think it will last, you know. Um, people will go beyond Crowley, and I'm sure that Crowley himself would have expected. Mm. yeah that's what i always say as well i i i I, um, I don't imagine that crody wanted his his writing to stop when it did you know but uh, yeah and there's probably there's probably a, a lot more work that he could have produced but um you know obviously health concerns and drug addiction etc probably stunted that somewhat but it, it does always um strike me that yeah it, it feels like it needs to be built upon you know um and it's quite good to hear that you said that about the typhonian order as well and this idea of like build you know you're, you're standing on the shoulders of giants really aren't you and, and building upon yeah. it uh, you know. yeah i mean kind of like you know that thing about standing on the shoulders of giants you know why does one stand on the shoulders of giants well one does one does it um so that you can absorb what's there you see you see i personally think that this is what all occultists do, whether con whether consciously or unconsciously. You no, know, I I think that we all take influences from um, a diversity of sources, and we, as it were, um, synthesize it through our own mystical and magical experience, um, and something inherent comes about. You know, and and sort of and other people. It will be, you know, what what I've done, for instance, you know, what anybody else has done um, will be one influence amongst several. But, you know, that's a crucial thing, isn't it? You know, you can actually, you can actually uh, liken it to, say, an artist, if you like. Um, you've got a perfect, perfect example there because, I mean, sort of all artists, you know, um, all artists draw on the work obviously not literally all artists are inspired to some degree by the work of other artists you know there's almost a sort of um, I, I don't know uh, what uh, what it is precisely there but they sort of they 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 rarely produce their body in isolation you know there's there's lots and lots of different influences like like for instance one time spare went through a beardsome phase, you know, that, that's undeniable. Um, went through went through a Japanese phase. Um, he sort of event eventually, well, fairly quickly, started producing, you know, uh, his own innate, unique uh, vision. But we're all influenced by, by others, and we all draw on others. Um, I was wondering... Um... How do you see the influence of Grant's books on the modern magical landscape? Do you do you see it continuing to influence, or I mean, like you're saying, there's a bit of a renaissance going on? But how do you see his kind of overall influence on the kind of modern magical landscape? Well, personally, I I I think it's a matter of I think it's a matter of inspiration. Um, I sometimes think that sort of. sort of people pick up on Grant and it it kind of inspires a vision um, in them. I, I don't really, when you say sort of magical landscapes, uh, I don't really think that there are magical landscapes, you know, you just, you just have sort of, uh, just really have a bunch of people um, that absorb somebody's work, work within somebody's work. Um, I think I think I I think it's true of everybody. Really. You know, I'm not sure that there's a magical landscape, um, you know, inspired by Crowley's work. Hmm. And what do you feel that um, Grant's kind of like lasting legacy will be? You know, where do you, you know um, where do you see his? I guess you know his legacy. Like, what 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 does he left behind? What you know. Well, basically, basically, he's left behind a body of work um, that will inspire um, other people. 
I think really that's that <laughs> that's uh, just about all that we can all hope for, really, isn't it? You know. Yeah. And and where where would you suggest starting? Because he's you know he's uh, you know my personal favourites. I mentioned them. The Carfax monograph is one of them. And the Magical revival. What year was that? Nineteen seventy two. Seventy two. Yeah. yeah. I personally, I I I personally would recommend um, starting. I mean, sort of none of Grant's that that easy, but probably the Magical revival um, and Alice Cronin Hidden God. Um, they're probably a bit easier than 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 the later work. You know, I mean, some people find the final trilogy uh, very difficult. It's my favourite, actually, to be honest. But it, it never used to be that way. You know, I used to prefer that, that earlier stuff. But I would recommend that that that, that people do start the magical revival. But also, you know, what you've mentioned, uh, the Carfax monographs. I mean that. That that is an absolutely excellent uh, place to start as well. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So um, let's talk a bit before you go. Let's uh, talk a bit about Starfire and um, like where you're, what, what what you have coming out. You know, what 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 what, what can we look forward to? I, I assume you're going to finish off the the three trilogies. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, basically by the end of this year, um, we'll have. Um, will have reprinted um, the Ninth Arch. So that'll be there. There's an awful lot of Kenneth Grant um, stuff to be published, actually. Um, one thing that I've been working on for quite a while is actually is actually to produce um, selected correspondence of Kenneth Grant. Uh, volume one at the moment uh, would cover the period from 42 to 1969 oh, that'd be interesting yeah an original and uh, an original un, unpublished so well it's unpublished so far so you know original original fresh material for the um i would like to publish um the grade rituals of new isis lodge actually i'd like to do that I mean, it, it's quite interesting. I never used to want to do that. I, I kind of wanted to sort of secrete it away and keep it as um, documents within, within the Typhonian order. But in a way, I'd rather kind of um, produce our own stuff from there. But the real reason, the real reason that I would publish it is because you publish it and you make it accessible to people and people and you know and maybe people will do something with it and um and sort of you know find maybe it will inspire something really really big and crucial um in them i mean i'm i mean i'm in my early 70s now you know i've probably only got 50 years left at the most <laughs> <laughs> No, but I'm aware. Because of what you I'm wish aware. for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, you know, the fresh blood of virgins, etc. Uh, but, yeah, you know, I'm aware that there's, that sort of, that there's lots of work to make accessible to people. You know, a lot of work of Kenneth Barnes. I, I, I mean, the correspondence, you know, the, the way that came about is because I set about um, documenting his uh, his stuff, you know, with Steffi. And when I come across something, you know, really, really interesting that I thought that Steffi would, would find interesting, I'd read it out to her. And then, <clears throat> and then one day she said to me, <clears throat> do you know, Michael, um, do you think that we might publish um, these letters? And, you know, I thought, well, thank you, God. Because <laughs> that, that is precisely what I've been thinking for quite a while, actually. You know, I, I just find particularly his work in the 1950s, you know, when he, when he, when he had pupils and he was kind of imparting um, from his, 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 vast, uh, his vast store of learning. Um, they're just, they are just... The most amazing letters that I've ever come across, you know, um, in terms of in terms of inspiration, absolutely fantastic. 
yeah, yeah. that'd be a fascinating publication I'm sure. yeah yeah i'd love to see that as well that'd be great um so have you got any other kind of confirmed things coming up like that you've already kind of announced or um outside of the trilogies is there any um because i know you, you did the alcab book is there any more because I, I remember reading somewhere you were going to publish uh like some of alcad's work as well rather than, yes, yeah. yes 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 uh, yes i'm um i'm Basically, um, I'm producing that with Henrik Bolton. Henrik Bolton's Henry Bolton's putting it together, doing the editing and the footnoting, etc. And volume one is basically going to consist of just what 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 you might call the major works, which is QBL, the Egyptian revival, and the anatomy of the body of God. And then there will be further volumes in the series. Um, there'll be so-called minor works you know which will be things thing, well i don't know things like uh crystal gazing uh things like um that essay he produced uh presented to crowley setting out um sort of deep cipher in the book of the law uh things like that and then sort of a bit further down the line you know there'll be sort of correspondence, further correspondence coming out and so forth. Um, unfortunately, both Henrik and myself, we've got too many irons in the fire, so um, it's taking a bit longer than we envisage to, to, to do it. But uh, I'd like it to be out by the end of this year, but I suspect we're looking at spring 2023. Okay, well, I mean, it's great that you're... Um... Yeah, it's coming because I mean uh, QBL, for example, I've ne- not been able to get hold of a you know a, a print copy of that. I can find it online, but I'd much rather have a physical book in my hand and oh, yeah. Yeah. and read it. Yeah. You know, it it's always to... best. Yeah, oh, and yeah. I mean, and I mean, sort of like the anatomy of the body of God. The body of God is a very beautiful book, actually. Interesting. Well, thank you so much for giving us some of your time. I really appreciate yeah. it. And, and it's patience. Been... And we're back. Uh, what did you think of that uh, that interview, Mr. Satir? Uh, Mr. Staley is a is a very enthusiastic, very enthusiastic communicator, and I appreciate that very much. Yeah. And what did you think about? Uh, did you learn anything new about the? I, I did actually. I mean, I was very curious about the the actual uh, character, the day to day character, the personality of Kenneth Grant, and um, how he related to other things. So uh, yes, that, that we we got that. We got that. We got that um, explored. I think what was interesting, I, I was uh, fascinated about the kind of uh, Lovecraft aspects and also the um, influences, and it was quite it was it was interesting to hear the uh, about the relationship with Austin Osmond Spare, and I thought that was that was fascinating, and Frater Arcad as well. I thought that was also interesting. It was uh, good to sort of I don't know. It's um, there's people have very strong opinions about. Um, Kenneth Grant, and it was quite interesting to, you know, um, hear a kind of largely positive um, take on him, you know, or, or it didn't feel like it was a hero worship either, which I found really interesting as well. I, I was kind of pleased about that, actually. I, I think it felt more like um, someone that appreciated his work and, um, you know, was keen to keep it uh, keep it alive and has done a very good job in doing so, I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and um, you know, and uh, you know, part of the Lovecraft. I mean, I, I, I mean, uh, when I think of Kenneth Grant and and Typhonian Order, I think of Lovecraft flavored thing, um, uh, and he, he seemed to not he'd not be so influenced by that. I mean, uh, I thought that I found that was intriguing. I mean, I, I'm a huge, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of lovecraft a uh, big enthusiast for his, his writing but um you know I, I as I'm, I'm i am an enthusiast of it as fiction in the purest sense of the word and um i i'm un, 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 maybe undecided uh, about um it's, it's it's potential in other respects but that's fine i mean you know i, I i'm i'm not here to, you know 
think that that's just as me, isn't it? So <laughs> what, what do I know about anything? I mean, anyone who listens to this would be able to, you know, would be able to come to their own judgment about that. I think, mm. but uh, yeah. So and you know, I'm I'm a great, you know, I'm a great believer that you know, it witnesses the vitality of something if it sprouts off in these very interesting sort of areas, mm. and um, long may it do so. Yeah, excellent. I'm I'm certainly intrigued and and fascinated. Like I said in the interview. I'm really. Ex- I find his books really exciting, personally, and um, you know, for me, it's been a real eye-opening experience. I don't know. I I, I genuinely enjoy the writings of Kenneth Grant, but uh, and I'm looking forward to talking. Like I said, in you know, we spoke to Michael afterwards, and we're definitely going to have him back on because I really like to delve deep a bit more deeply into the kind of philosophies of Kenneth Grant and the um, some of the magical ideas of of, of Kenneth Grant um, rather than you know, because this was a very this. This episode is meant to be more of like a 101 broad look at Kenneth Grant and the Typhonian um, perspective. And uh, yeah, I think we did a pretty good job of that. And I'm looking forward to uh, delving deeper into, into the, you know, in the future. So uh, yeah, anyway, if you want to find us on social media, you can at Sitting Now at most places. Uh, follow us on um, uh, Instagram, on Twitter, um, also on YouTube. Uh, where I keep threatening to put videos out, which <laughs> I will do, I promise. Uh, they are coming. Um, and yeah, just uh, keep an eye out for the next episode. Uh, I'm not sure who it's with, but I'm sure it'll be good. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>